what I, what I plan to do here is to um, hit key points in Scripture and, and run through the Old Testament. Um, so that's what we're doing. So you know me and uh, that if we were preaching through Genesis, um, I'd be preaching that the week before I preached your funeral, right? Um, it, it's so rich, you know, and so we, we've just hardly been able to get out chapter two even. Uh, but just to hit key points for you so that uh, you become more educated and, and, and in, uh, growing in your own, your own depth of who God is and how he's acted in history. So as we go through Genesis here, we're going to hit some, some key points, and then we'll uh, hit something in Exodus, maybe not a lot, uh, but, but some. We preached through Exodus way back, like 15 years ago. Um, and uh, that's when the workmen's came in the church. We were in Exodus, um, back in Rainbow Lanes. And then we'll just keep, keep plowing through uh, Scripture. And, and I hope that, as it does for you, as it does for me, gives you a, a sense of satisfaction, which is a good thing to have, uh, of knowing God more, uh, of not thinking, you know, there's a book out there I just really don't even, if someone asked me what we're about, I'd have no idea. And, and it's nice to be able to say, you know what, I kind of know what's going on in Micah, uh, or I kind of know the contours of Genesis. And so that's what we're doing here. So we're, we're at Genesis chapter 6, and we're looking at Noah, and uh, what Noah is about, and what, what God teaches us about his gospel, about Jesus who is uh, foreshadowed by Noah, uh, what God teach, teaches us about his son Jesus and about the gospel uh, through Noah here. So Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, this is God's word eternally true. When men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also, uh, and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children with them, by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only on evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make for yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. Okay, I'll skip the measurements there. We'll go to verse 17. By the way, the ark was about the size of what you could put in between the bleachers of a football field. It's about end zone to end zone to the bleachers, and then from bleachers to bleachers across there. That's, that's about the dimension of it. Verse 17, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Here ends our reading. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Um, if you're watching the Olympics or online or whatever, yesterday you probably saw the crab 
tree shooting thing and all that chaos that was going on there. And, and it's like, yep, got another one uh, there. Stuff in Orlando, stuff here, stuff there. Uh, the world's a violent place, and it's surprising to us because we live in the United States, but it's not surprising to you know, people in Sudan. Uh, it's not surprising to, to people in uh, Slovakia. It's not surprising to um, the Kurds that were in Turkey. Um, you know, the world is a very violent place, and, and, and we see a very violent scene here. And, and what happens when um, God is not a part, when the Spirit of God is not a part of a person's life or people's lives, uh, when other things become God's for them, uh, quickly things go to, to violence and selfishness and the, the exercise of dominion that's not for the good of mankind, which was the, uh, the mandate to Adam, exercise dominion for the good of the, the creatures, for the earth, for the plants, for mankind, but exercising dominion that is to suppress other people, to take what you can because you simply can, uh, to, use your, to use your strength to do what you want to do. And, and clearly in this passage, and there's a question about who are the Nephilim and, and the sons of, sons of God and that kind of thing. These were rulers. These are terms in the ancient Near East to talk about rulers, kings and nobles and governors. And essentially they were just taking whatever women they wanted to do and, and pulling them by the hair and, and raping them and that kind of thing. And, and so that's why it's brought up here. It goes into the, the context here of violence. Okay, so these are... These are men who are rulers and using their power um, to do whatever they wanted to the vulnerable, okay? to those who, who can't fight back or those who are powerless in society, those who have no way of, of protecting themselves. And so God looks down upon that uh, and we see his solution for this. He's, he's sorrowful and he's, he's grieved that he's made man. And so, he says, here's my solution. I'm just going to wipe it, wipe it all out. Um, so that's what we're looking at. That's the context of this today. Uh, certainly the people under Moses who were receiving the book of Genesis understood this. Um, their Nephilim was Pharaoh and their slave masters. The, the sons of God, these governors over them who were cruel to them were the slave masters and, and officials in Egypt. They knew what it was like to get taken advantage of, to just be pulled from where you were by force and forced to do uh, something else. And, and, and the good news we see from, from Scripture is this, and, and it's your number one in your outline there. If you want to um, follow along in the outline and fill that out, you're welcome to do that. God will not allow, here's what God says to us in this passage, God will not allow the strong to do evil on the earth forever. And we live in an era, even post-Noah, in which the strong do evil. And sometimes it's the weak uh, uh, acting like they're strong or, or using a weapon that makes them strong. You know, anyone's strong who has a gun in his hand. You know, it doesn't matter if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, if someone has a gun to you and you're Arnold, you know, that person's stronger than you are at this point. But we live in an era in which the strong uh, are doing what they want to do. And the strong, given certain situations of weakness, exploit those situations, like Hitler. You know, Hitler comes, I love what Norm MacDonald says about Hitler, you know, the more I learn about this guy, the less I like him. <laughs> Um, but, but he gets in a situation, Germany's at its weakest point. It's devastated from the, the repercussions and the, the reparations it has to pay for World War I. Okay. And so the economy has tanked. They've had to send all this money to repair these other nations of Europe. And so it allows the strong uh, to rise up and to do what they will. And so the Jews in Germany are then, are then uh, decimated because um, they, they, they're the weak, the weak class. And there's official 
uh, governmental uh, boycotting of Jewish businesses during the 1930s uh, in Germany under, under Hitler and, and so forth. But God will not allow the strong to do evil on the earth forever. And you see examples of the, the evil here in these verses 3 through 5, 7, 13, and 17. And that God says, I will wipe it out. I will wipe it out. Number two, number two. The inclination of the human heart is to do evil. God communicates that to us here. Um, and, and you see that there in, in verse 5 and then verse 11, verse 12. Um, we see it in Galatians 5, 16 through 21. What is the fruit of the flesh? What do we naturally do? Or you see it in what Jim read to us this morning from Romans chapter 7. What do we naturally do? Uh, we naturally rebel against the law of God. We, we naturally do what's selfish uh, for us. Um, it's not the case that man is born innocent and desiring to do good, but society corrupts him. Man is born evil and society corrupts him. So both are true. Uh, we at our core, our, our inclination, why, why do we flee from the God who promises to bless us? And we've experienced God blessing us. And yet the inclination of our heart is always to squeak out from doing his law. We've experienced doing his law and the blessing of doing his law, right? Like James 1.25 says. Okay? But yet, for some reason, we're always doing what we don't want to do. And Jim did a good job with that passage. It's the, you know, the passage my wife calls the doobie-doo passage. Uh, it's a tongue twister. Um, those things I want to do, I don't do, you know, all that. Um, and, and Paul's saying, I know what's right in my head. In my head, I want to do the law of God because I know that's best. And I've experienced in my life when I do the law of God, I, I, I feel good inside that God blesses me, but I don't do the things I want to do in my head. Why? Because I am a sinful person. And I sin because I'm a sinner. My heart is corrupt. I'm one of these people in Genesis chapter 6. I'm corrupt, and I corrupt all my ways. So it's one of the reasons we, we uh, have preaching at a worship service week after week. It's because it's, 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 our, it's our adjustment. We get, we get uh, uh, our, our corruption checked when we, when we come here. We realize, oh, yeah, and we need to hear these things over and over again because our hearts are, as Jeremiah says, deceitful above all else. And we can't understand how deceitful we are. So uh, the inclination of the human heart is to do evil. A there in your outline. This description in Genesis 6 describes us too. It describes us. And we know it. Even though we know God, even though we have his spirit in us, we're inclined to do what is not God's will. And then so B, evil in a just world is destroyed. That's what God does. If the world, now if this world, if this era were just, evil would be destroyed. And what God shows us here is that he's a just God. And everybody wants justice in the world except against themselves. Right? I want God to do justice against everybody else, but not me. Because if he does justice against me, then I'm destroyed too. Um, I need mercy. Uh, and, and so what God shows us here is he's a just God. All will have to give an account for every word they've, they've said and every deed they have done. Evil in a just world is destroyed. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So the question remains, so are we destroyed? Because our hearts are inclined to evil as well. Are we destroyed? The Israelites under Moses, they knew they weren't innocent. They were being abused just like these women were in Genesis 6. Uh, they were being abused by Egypt, but they knew they weren't that faithful either. They weren't sinless. A good Israelite, when the plagues are coming down on Egypt, are to understand that's what I deserve. That's what the 10th plague is about. 
You know, what, what I deserve is the fate of this lamb here. This lamb that God told me to slaughter. This lamb whose blood God told me to put over my, my doorposts, uh, up above the door and on the side of the door, because I deserve to be killed tonight. But the blood on my door says, well, I have a substitute, a lamb, and his blood marks that a death has occurred on my behalf, so I don't have to, I don't have to die. So a good Israelite un understands that, that this is talking about us too. Um, we deserve to be wiped out in a flood because of, our own, because of our own sin. We deserve to be wiped out at final judgment. We deserve the way, lake of fire for eternity because of our sin. Okay. So are we destroyed? Um, well, if, if, if we are, you're wasting your time here. <laughs> you don't need to come to a church to find out you're going to be destroyed week after week. You come, come to a church to find out you won't be destroyed. But, but, but how? So number three, you can be saved from the coming destruction and judgment, but not by your righteousness. Not by your own righteousness. How are you saved from the destruction you deserve? How am I saved from the destruction I deserve for my sins? Not by being righteous. Not by my own righteousness. And that's, that's a key thing for us to get here. As my pastor in Bloomington, Indiana used to say, we always associate ourselves with the wrong people in Scripture. We always associate ourselves with the good guys. But, but we're the ones there saying, crucify him, crucify him. We're supposed to see ourselves in that crowd. We're supposed to see ourselves in Peter who denies Jesus, because that's who we are, really. And, and we're not to see ourselves, or as you have here in your outline, you are not Noah here, verses 8 and 9. You and I are not the Noah figure in this passage. God didn't look down on you before you came to know Christ, and say, ah, there's a righteous woman. He didn't look down on you before you were saved and say, ah, there's a righteous man. I have favor upon him. B, instead, who are you? Well, if you're here and, and you've believed in Jesus, you're Noah's family. Okay? You are Noah's family. You're Noah's family. Verse 18. Uh, let me explain. Uh, see, Jesus is Noah today. Jesus is Noah. Uh, Noah is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Now, Noah is a real historical figure, and all this really happened, and God causes all these things to happen in history before Jesus comes that become an example of what he is. Jesus is Noah. Um, number one, he is the righteous one. Jesus is the righteous one. Just like God looks down Noah and says, there's a righteous man among all this ungodless, ungodliness on the earth. There's a righteous man. And Jesus is this righteous one whom the Father favors. Jesus is the righteous one among all the wickedness that goes on on the earth. Everyone on the earth sins. And he looks down and he sees Jesus. And Jesus is the righteous one. 1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Matthew 3.17, at Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist hears the Father say from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is the favored one, the righteous one. Number two, so by him... By Jesus and the favor he has earned by his righteous life, by his never sinning, by him, by the favor he has earned, you can be saved. You can be saved. And saved from final judgment. Not just saved from a worldwide flood back during Noah's day, but saved from final judgment, just like Noah's family. See how you're in that position there of Noah's family? They get saved not because they're righteous. They get saved because Noah's righteous. 
They get saved not because God looks down on Noah's family and says, hey, there's a family who's righteous. He says, no, there's a man, Noah, and he's a righteous man. And God's favor is upon him. And Noah's sons and his sons' wives and Noah's wife get saved because of the righteousness of another, because of the righteousness of Noah, their dad, their father-in-law, their husband. And that's, that's Jesus for us. That's Jesus for us. Um, Noah is this righteous man, this preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7, and 10 through 12. Um, Acts 4, verse 12. There's only one name by which we can be saved, the name of Jesus. Not by our own name can we be saved. Not by our own righteousness. We can't say, uh, I, I'm going to, when we're before God's judgment throne, we can't say, well, I'm saved because of me, because I'm John. Or I, I'm saved because of Catherine. No, only one name. Jesus' name. He's the entry. Noah's the entry, knowing Noah, being associated with Noah, being his child or being his bride. Okay, that rings some bells for you. We're children of God through faith in Jesus. We're the bride of Christ. We're his church. If you're God's children, if you're his bride, if you're Noah's children, if you're Noah's bride, you're saved. You're saved. Um, 1 John 5, 11 and, 11 and 12 uh, talk about this, that there's salvation only in Jesus. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Is Noah your dad? Is Noah your husband? Well, then you have the life. If not, tough luck. So, uh, next line in your outline there, with your initial faith in Jesus upon hearing and believing the gospel, you, in this picture of the gospel we have here in Genesis 6, you got on what? You got on the boat. That's what your initial faith was. That's the picture God gives of the gospel here. Your initial faith in Jesus, when you said, I need Jesus to survive the flood of judgment coming upon me at final judgment. When you said, I need Jesus, I can't make it on my own. You got on the boat. You got on this ark that's Jesus. And you're saved not because you're a good swimmer. You're saved not because you knew to build a boat. You're saved because Noah built a boat for you. And he invited you in the gospel to come in. Noah's a preacher of righteousness. He's there building that boat and, and, and whether he's actually proclaiming that, that judgment is coming or whether the boat was just a, a, a symbol of that coming judgment, that's a testimony there in that ancient world that judgment is coming. Um, and so that's what's told to us in the gospel. God doesn't speak directly to any of us. He speaks to Noah, to Moses, to Jesus. And Noah, Moses, and Jesus say to you, I'll deliver you out of the destruction, out of Egypt, out of the tenth plague, out of your slavery to sin. But you got to follow me. You got to believe me. You got to believe me that there's a final judgment coming. You got to believe me that tonight, tenth plague, that all the firstborn in Egypt are going to be killed miraculously. You got to believe me. If you do, you got to have blood that covers your door. And that's what the gospel is. It's saying there's final judgment coming and you've got to have a, the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, to cover your life or you won't make it. You'll be eternally dead, eternally dead in the lake of fire. And so Jesus promises deliverance from this, deliverance to, from slavery, deliverance from this flood that covers the earth. And he promises, get this, we didn't read this as part of Noah, he promises a new heaven and new earth. Get that, Noah? He gets out of the ark through his salvation, through the chaos of this life, and he comes out and there's a new earth. Everything is budding afresh. No more sin in the world, at least that wasn't their own. <laughs> no people to be afraid of. 
everything cleansed. And that's what Jesus promises in his second coming to cleanse. And we saw that there in 2 Peter 3, didn't we? Jesus will cleanse everything, not with, a, not with a flood of water, but with a flood of fire. And the elements will melt with its heat, its purification fire. All disease and all sickness and everything that's bad will be purified through the fire of his coming. And he comes to create a new heaven and a new earth, which is a home of righteousness. 2 Peter 3, a home of righteousness in which we rejoice. This is the gospel. Noah is promised a home of righteousness, cleansed from the sin of this wickedness of the violence that we see on the earth today that Noah saw during his day. That's the promise. That's the promise of the gospel. What we don't get it by our own righteousness, we get it by Noah's righteousness, the righteousness of the new Noah, Jesus. He's our only claim before the throne of God at final judgment. The blood of Jesus. That's how we overcome, right? Book of Revelation, they overcome by the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb. We claim Jesus before the throne of God. You became a son or daughter of Noah when you believed. You became but as many as John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To as many as received Noah's message, his sons did, his wife did, his, his sons' uh, uh, wives did. They received Noah's message, and they got on the boat. By your new status as a son of the new Noah, Jesus, you're saved from not a coming judgment of water, but final judgment coming when Jesus returns. So what does this do for us? What does this do for us? Uh, it makes us grateful for one. Uh, we couldn't save ourselves. We weren't righteous enough that God looked down on any of us and said, I favor him. I favor her. So we're grateful that there's a, a Noah, a Jesus for us by whom we're saved. Um, but there's a to-do um, that, that comes in this passage as well. And uh, here it is. Uh, it comes from this. Number four. Others can be saved from final judgment, too. Others beside you. Um, we read about the sons of God, Nephilim, um, the corruption on the earth that there is. And, and God, by a mere decision, brings about their defeat, um, brings about their destruction. And so, A, there in your outline, just as the violence and power of the rulers of Noah's day were no match for God. Were no match for the decision of God to end it, to bring about judgment. So today the disbelief of those who hate God is no match for the decision of God to conquer their unbelief. So here's the, the, the deal for uh, the original readers of the book of Genesis. Um, they had two realms of conquering that should have scared them a lot. One, they had to conquer Pharaoh and Pharaoh's armies and their slave masters to get to the new heaven, the new earth of the promised land, so to speak. Uh, but then when they got out of Egypt, they had to conquer the Canaanites, the Amorites. Okay, so that's pretty intimidating there. And what this message shows them as they're reading this from Genesis 6 at that time is not the strongest of men is any match for God. Pharaoh is no match for God. The Nephilim are no match from, for God. The rulers of the earth are no match for God. God can just decide I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to crush them for Noah's sake. God can do anything. He's a God of great power. All these people that were exercising violence on the earth, they didn't believe they were accountable to God. They didn't believe that they would have to answer to him. And that's why they were doing what they were doing. And you know people in your life today who are like that. They don't believe or they're suppressing the truth that they're accountable to God and that they're going to have to give an answer to them 
and they are going to, and they don't seem in your own mind to be someone that's going to receive Jesus, to believe in him, to trust in his gospel, then maybe that's discouraging to you. Uh, maybe you have folks in your life that have taken conscious steps to run away from God, um, who are very confident in their own abilities to be a good person before God or claim great confidence that there's no afterlife. And so you think there's no hope. Well, you, you join in with the people of God there in Egypt who are thinking about how can we possibly see Pharaoh overcome and Pharaoh's army overcome. Pharaoh's abusing us because he thinks he doesn't answer, have to answer to our God. How can the Canaanites be overcome? And this is a message that nobody is a challenge to God. Nobody's a challenge to God. So be, be. In other words, God can save Saul of Tarsus. If there was one person in the early church that every Christian said, here's one person God will not, cannot save. It was Saul of Tarsus. And God saves him. It's no problem to crush Pharaoh. It's no problem to crush the Pharisee of Pharisees. It's no problem to crush the one who is putting to death people in the church. God can save anybody. Think of the person in your life who is the most adamant against the gospel. That's your Saul of Tarsus. And God says, really, you think he's a match for me? Really, you think the Nephilim are a match for me? All I got to do is speak the word. And, and the waters come out from the, the core of the earth. And the, 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 the heavens above, the clouds pour down water, and there's a worldwide flood. That wasn't hard for the Lord to do, to crush the unbelief that existed all around the world except for with Noah and his family there. So God can save Saul, and two accounts of that, Acts 9 and Acts 26. So here's the application to this. Number one, enter into the realm of the wicked. Now, of course, you don't want to take that out of context and put that up um, and put me on trial for heresy at that point, right? Enter into the realm of the wicked. This is what Jesus does when he comes from heaven. He enters into the realm of the wicked. He enters into the realm of people whose hearts are always inclined to evil all the time. He enters into the realm of the, the very people who would crucify him. And he extends mercy. Enter into the realm of the wicked. Uh, and this is what Moses is commanded to do in Exodus 3.8. Go to Egypt. Moses, get out of Midian. Get out of your safe space here in the hills of Midian, shepherding sheep with Jethro who knows me. Go to the core of violence and wickedness and unbelief and the thought that we are kings, we are gods. Pharaoh himself thought he was God and speak to him of another God that he had to answer to. And say to Pharaoh, who thinks he's God, my God says, let my people go. And you better, or else these 10 things are coming. Okay. So enter into the realm of the wicked. Enter into the realm of the wicked. Uh, this is what is uh, told to Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 15. I've listed that for you there. This, this promised land. Enter in, go in, it's promised to you. And then to arm yourself with not moral legislation, not the Republican Party, not your own righteousness, not never admitting your sin. Okay, your, your battle sword is not, I never sin, you should be like me. Your battle sword is not who you are in your own righteousness. Aren't I great? That's not what you enter into the realm of the wicked with. We don't promote ourselves. And we shouldn't 
because of who we are. We're sinners. We don't arm ourselves with, hey, I'm a Christian, and I'm cool, Jesus is cool, be a Christian, therefore, the message of most evangelical churches. We'll care. My cool, my nerd, I don't care. I'm going to heaven. My God is great. I don't care what you think of me. Think me a nerd. Think me cool. Who cares? I don't care. But know Jesus. That's what matters. Okay. Okay, enough nopes. Arm yourselves with what? The gospel. Arm yourselves with the gospel. Um, Ephesians 6.17, it is, here's your next blank, it is the sword of the spirit, the word of God. When we go into the realm of the wicked, when we go up against Pharaoh who thinks he's not accountable to God, when you go up against your, your friend who, who thinks he knows it all and that, that, that you're a simpleton for believing in Jesus, when you go against him, don't tell him, all my life has worked out well. Because it hasn't. None of our lives has worked. We all have things in our lives that have been very painful and things that are currently in our lives that are very painful. Okay? So that's not your message. The message is, I know Noah, and he's got a boat, and you can get on it too. That's the sword of the Spirit. That's our weaponry as we go out into the world. Not, I'm good, you can be cool, good too. Not, I'm cool, you can be cool too. Not, Jesus is cool. Not, Jesus is your buddy. Jesus will forgive your sins and he's God and he's the final judge at final judgment. And if you know him, if you get on his boat, he reads your name from the book of life and you're saved. That's the sword of the spirit. We go forward and we say to, into the world of evil and we say, you know what? I'm wicked too. I sin every day throughout the day. And that's why I need Jesus. I'm not going to have a day in my whole life where I don't sin. So I need Jesus. Are you like that? You ever have a day where you don't sin? We say to the non-believer. And hopefully we can eke out of them a little bit of honesty, uh, what they know to be true. So arm yourself with the gospel. It's the sword of the spirit by which today God destroys wickedness. So verse 13, God's destroying wickedness. Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the spirit. Uh, Revelation 6, 2, Jesus goes out. He's riding a, on, on a white horse with a bow, and he's conquering. He's a conqueror bent on conquest. Just as God conquested, conquested conquered uh, uh, wickedness during Noah's day through a flood, today he conquers wickedness through the sword of his spirit. And that's what he did for us. He conquered our wickedness. He conquered our rebellion against him. He conquered our boastful spirits that said, I'm a good person. I deserve God's, God's favor. He conquered, he conquered that. Um, Romans, uh, Romans 8, 13, by the spirit, he put to death the misdeeds of the body. Um, God conquers as Christians then also our wickedness by his spirit, our wickedness by the gospel. 1 John 3, 8, um, he who does what is sinful is of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. That's what the Lord is doing in all our lives. He's destroying the devil's, he's destroying the devil's work. So number three, we arm ourselves with the gospel. We go into the realm of wickedness, this world. We don't live the life of a monk. We go into this world and we talk with people who are non-believers. We promote Jesus and his gospel, not ourselves, because the gospel is the sword of the spirit. Um, and then number three, know that God can conquer even the rabidly unbelieving with his gospel. Believe this. Um, God conquers the, those who are wicked in verses 2 through 4 in Genesis 6. But here's what Paul says in Romans 1:16. Um, he, he says, the gospel is the power of God for those who are believing. So when we go out with the gospel, that's the power of God we go out with. God can conquer anybody. He can conquer, the, uh, the, he can conquer Saul of Tarsus. Okay? 
and he conquered you and he conquered me so I can conquer anybody. And then D, recognize this. As you're in this realm of darkness, this realm of wickedness which Noah was in, which we're in now in this world, realize this, D, the whole reason this unbelieving world of wickedness goes on, goes on, is that Jesus now and actively is saving individuals by his gospel. We read this three times in what Jim read for us this morning. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 and 15. Why is Jesus not coming back yet? Uh, 2 Peter, that's the big question. And at the beginning of chapter 3, Jim read for us, it was, it was you know, you're getting mocked. And people are saying, where is this coming, he's promised. It, everything's going on today just like it always has from the beginning. But then Peter says, but you count that slow. But to, to God, a day is as a thousand years is a thousand, a thousand years is a day. This is not slow in God's economy. And why is God not coming now? Because his slowness now, his patience means for you salvation. Jesus is saving more and more people. Every day Jesus waits to come back, he saves more and more people. Revelation 6, the passage Jim read, the fifth seal, the, the dead saints in heaven, their souls around Jesus say, when, Jesus, are you going to avenge our blood? We were mocked, we were scorned, we were killed. When are you going to avenge our blood? And Jesus says, hold on. Be patient now because I'm gathering the rest of your brothers. Every day Jesus doesn't come back. He's gathering more brothers and sisters into his family. Your brothers and sisters in the faith. This is why Jesus isn't back now. Because he's still gathering people who will be your brothers and sisters in Christ. People who do not yet now today believe in Jesus. And so you know, put this all together. Why is the flood of final judgment not here? Because God has for you to be used. God has for this church and all his churches and all the believers around on the earth to be used to bring into the church more people who are saved. Future brothers and sisters in Christ of yours. So the whole reason this unbelieving world of wickedness goes on is that Jesus is gathering more unbelievers. Maybe one of the unbelievers he's gathering is a, a workmate of yours or a neighbor of yours or that relative of yours who makes fun of you because you're devoted to Jesus and in his church. So hear that and be encouraged. Um, Jesus doesn't speak audibly on the earth today like he, God spoke to Noah. Um, he didn't speak to you audibly when you came to faith. He spoke to you through another person, through others, through others. And that's your, your number one there. Jesus spoke to rescue you from judgment through others, just like Noah's family. They were rescued not because they heard the voice of God. They were rescued through Noah's word. And then number two, and God says to you, now you, you be one of those others through whom I speak to the unbelieving. And uh, maybe some will be like those in Noah's day who don't get on the boat. But maybe others will be like Noah's daughters-in-law, Noah's sons, Noah's wife, and, and they'll get on. So that is, God says to you, number two, be a part of my saving work to others. Be a part of my saving work to others. Um, go make disciples of all nations. Speak up. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to share the whole gospel with a person and, and see them come to faith uh, in Christ right there, but speak up and say something. And maybe that'll be a part of that person saying, yeah, maybe there is something to this ark. Maybe I should think about that. Um, God's, God wants to use us in that way. And who knows? 
maybe some of these folks around us, God has sovereignly placed there for the purpose of salvation, uh, that his patience would mean salvation to them. Let's pray.